This Tuesday, the U.S. president signed into law a sweeping tax, health care and climate bill called the Inflation Reduction Act, a significantly pared back version of the Build Back Better plan, which he was pushing for last year. The bill was held up at the last moment over a provision that would have increased taxes on the private equity industry. In his remarks before signing the bill, Joe Biden said, Today, the American people won and the special interest lost other than the private equity industry, of course. Fans of the new law claim that it will improve citizens' finances while reducing the federal deficit, and critics say that it will lead to higher taxes for individuals and corporations, and that it'll be ineffective at dampening inflation. Let's look at the new legislation and try and work out to what extent it might reduce inflation, which has been at its highest rate in around 40 years, and see who the winners and losers are. The Act provides for new spending and tax incentives related to the adoption of clean energy technology, both at the industrial and the consumer level. It extends a temporary expansion of Affordable Care Act health insurance subsidies for an additional two years. Then to offset these deficit increasing initiatives, the bill implements a new minimum tax on large corporations' book income, reduces government outlays on prescription drugs through pricing reforms, and provides for additional IRS funding, which is supposed to increase increase revenue collections in excess of the cost of implementation. Most experts right now are saying that the bill should have a minimal impact on inflation overall, at least initially. The Penn Wharton budget model says that there should be no significant impact over the next few years. They argue that it doesn't add to inflation, which was a concern that people had with the Build Back Better plan, but at the same time it does nothing to reduce price rises either. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office determined that the bill would have a negligible effect on inflation this year and next, and the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, a group that advocates for lower deficits, said that most households will not see much change right away, but some will see real reductions in what they're paying for things like health care and energy. The new law includes a $369 billion investment in climate and energy policies, $64 billion to reduce health insurance costs under the Affordable Care Act, and a 15% corporate minimum tax aimed at companies that earn more than $1 billion a year. To get a deal done, Biden had to give up some of his favorite pieces of the original Build Back Better plan, including universal child care and tax cuts for the middle class. The $437 billion spending package is supposed to raise $737 billion in revenue over the next decade, the biggest share coming from reductions in drug prices for Medicare recipients and tax hikes on corporations. Roughly $124 billion is expected to come from increased IRS enforcement, possibly meaning tougher and more frequent audits for Americans. Overall, it's projected to reduce the deficit by more than $300 billion over a decade. The White House claims that the package will address inflation in two key ways. One, by lowering energy and health care costs for families, and two, by helping to bring down the deficit. Okay, so how might this act affect the finances of an American family, both now and over the next decade? And what industries are most likely to be affected by the act? First up, the new law is very focused on clean and sustainable energy. It includes $80 billion in rebates to help households pay for green energy upgrades. Subsidies cover home improvements like efficient heat pumps, electric water heaters, and electric cooktops. Homeowners can receive a 30% credit for installing solar panels, for example. So if you're planning on spending money to upgrade your home, the new law should make this more affordable for you. Obviously, this provides less benefit to poorer households who either don't own homes or who can't afford to upgrade their appliances. Next up is the much-hyped $7,500 credit for people who buy a new electric vehicle, which begins next year. 
Now, there are income limits on who can claim this credit, and this is in response to criticisms that it largely serves wealthy people buying expensive cars. On top of this, there's a $4,000 credit for people who buy used electric vehicles. The credits are limited to cars that cost $55,000 or less, or because it's America, trucks and SUVs that retail for $80,000 or less. The idea behind these caps is to push manufacturers to produce more affordable EV models that the average American is likely to buy. The Inflation Reduction Act includes nearly $80 billion to be spent over 10 years in new funding for the IRS. This is supposed to help the agency increase enforcement measures and collect unpaid taxes. As I'm sure you've heard, this portion of the act has become a political flashpoint where opponents have expressed concern that the IRS will use this new funding to hire 87,000 new agents to target and harass average taxpayers. The act itself does not specify that the funding be used to hire agents. It can be used for a variety of projects within the IRS. The Congressional Budget Office estimates that with this funding, approximately $203 billion in additional taxes will be collected over 10 years, which would raise net federal revenue by more than $124 billion over that time period. Proponents of this new funding argue that taxpayers will get their phone calls returned a lot quicker and that the legislation would make it possible for Americans to file their annual taxes directly with the IRS free of charge rather than having to use an accountant or a piece of third-party software. Opponents describe it as a stealth tax hike and argue that average Americans are more likely to be audited by this better funded version of the IRS. Next up, the new legislation allows Medicare to negotiate prices with pharmaceutical companies, beginning with 10 prescription medications in 2026 and moving to 20 prescription medications by 2029. So that should have an effect, but it's not really very fast moving. The Act will additionally require pharmaceutical companies to pay rebates starting next year if they raise medication prices faster than the rate of inflation. Out-of-pocket costs will be capped for Medicare recipients at $2,000 a year starting in 2025, and insulin costs for people with diabetes will max out at $35 a month. So if you're on Medicare, your premiums and drug prices should be constrained, but not immediately. You'll likely see healthcare costs rise no more than the rate of inflation, which isn't exactly amazing considering the current rate of inflation. Overall, the cost reductions are piecemeal and spread out over time, but should keep Medicare recipients' costs at or below inflation. On top of this, millions of Americans will continue to benefit from the Affordable Care Act subsidies that help with rising health insurance premiums. These subsidies were originally slated to expire next year. Okay, so what about other items? Well, most of the biggest drivers of inflation, including food and energy costs, are not immediately addressed by the legislation. According to the analysis by the University of Pennsylvania's Penn Wharton budget model, there's a chance that the legislation could reduce inflation by around 0.1 percentage points in about five years, but they note that they have a low level of confidence that the legislation would have any measurable impact on inflation. Okay, so next up, let's talk about the biggest source of revenue in the new act, which comes from a 15% minimum corporate tax rate. To be subject to the minimum tax, U.S. corporations have to earn an average of at least $1 billion in adjusted book income, which is the earnings that they report to shareholders, less some adjustments, over the previous three years. This tax will hit foreign companies too, though they only need to report $100 million in U.S. income. How it will work is that companies subject to this tax will have to calculate their tax liability twice, once under regular corporate income tax rules, and again by multiplying their adjusted book income by 15%. Their taxes then, whichever of the two is greater. 
A few important adjustments included in the bill will limit how much companies pay under the minimum tax. To prevent manufacturers from facing high minimum tax bills, companies will be able to use some of the same credits and deductions they use to reduce their regular corporate tax bills. This will lower the minimum tax they pay as well. An earlier version of the bill would have subjected private equity funds to the minimum tax, but intense lobbying means that this got pulled out at the last minute, along with retaining the carried interest loophole that the bill initially was supposed to close. In the end, less than 150 companies, including firms like Amazon, AT&T and General Motors, are expected to be subject to the tax. Additionally, under the bill, companies will face a new 1% excise tax on purchases of their own shares. This is the buyback tax that you'll have heard of. Proponents say that instead of returning cash to shareholders, big companies should use this money to increase employees' wages or invest in the business. This new tax is projected to bring in $74 billion in revenue over the next 10 years. That obviously affects the returns of investors. It's unlikely that such a tax will actually translate into higher pay for workers, as worker pay is more driven by supply and demand of labour than cash on hand at businesses. Investing money back into businesses may not necessarily happen either, as investment is already at very high levels, and there's no indication that companies are skipping investing on worthwhile projects due to a lack of cash right now. The most likely outcome is that most of the money not spent on buybacks will end up being added to the pile of around $8 trillion in cash that US companies are already sitting on. With the new buybacks tax scheduled to take effect at the start of next year, you might see a flurry of buybacks in the next few months as companies get them done before the new tax takes effect. Okay, so how does this bill affect the energy industry? Well, the act includes more than $360 billion to address climate change, something that the White House and major environmental groups are touting as a huge win. Solar and wind tax incentives will be extended for a decade. Up until now, the tax credits had to be renewed every year or two. On top of this, tax credits will be made available for new technologies like utility-scale batteries and nuclear power gets financial support in the bill too. While the Act concentrates on clean energy incentives, it also helps the fossil fuel industry by mandating the leasing of vast areas of public lands and offshore. The Act locks renewables and fossil fuels together, so if the administration wants solar and wind projects on public lands, it must offer new oil and gas leases first. The oil and gas industry saw some other wins too for green technologies that they believe are an important part of an energy transition. ExxonMobil and Chevron have both put carbon capture and storage, hydrogen and biofuels at the heart of their low carbon businesses. All of these technologies get new and bigger incentives. For instance, the tax credit for new carbon capture and storage projects will rise from a maximum of $50 per ton of CO2 buried in the ground to $85 per ton, which could help make more carbon capture and storage projects profitable. Next up, let's talk about employment. One of the big ideas behind the bill is that the US can have a made in America energy transition that creates jobs. It's also supposed to reduce the problems associated with international supply chains, as most of these green technologies are manufactured abroad right now. So for this reason, domestic clean technology manufacturing and solar will be subsidized. In order for domestic projects to qualify for the subsidies, they'll have to pay workers what are referred to as prevailing wages, which pegs the wages for specific occupations to the union pay rate in the local area. 
electric vehicles will have to be assembled in North America, and the lithium, copper, and other critical minerals used in the cars need to be extracted from mines in America or friendly countries that have free trade agreements with the United States. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tweeted that the new act will be good for Canada and its green energy manufacturing sector, which will benefit from Americans receiving tax credits for purchasing electric vehicles made in North America. Some of the measures in the act, such as narrowing the deficit, lowering drug prices and making the US less vulnerable to energy price spikes, could contribute somewhat to reducing inflation on a small scale. If the bill reduces deficits and pulls money out of the economy, either through collecting more taxes or reducing corporate profits, that means that there's less money to go around, which does reduce demand for goods which could have an effect on inflation. Monetary policy is still the main tool for fighting inflation. It's possible that the new law could convince people that Congress is trying to do something to address inflation, which could lead to lower expectations for future inflation, which can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Let me know your thoughts on the Inflation Reduction Act in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch my recent video on whether we're in the middle of a housing bubble or not. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.